You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Welcome to the Foundry Church today. As we get going and dive into Luke chapter 2, we're going to talk today really about the perfect words and what those are. I don't know if you've ever been tongue-tied or found yourself in a situation where it was really awkward and you didn't know what to say, but um, today we're going to look at a passage where Jesus reveals to us some of the things going on in our own hearts, but also um, assures us that he won't leave us in a lurch. He won't leave us without his spirit guiding us. So today I want to talk about the perfect words. But in order to talk about the perfect words, I think we have to remember the importance of listening. The importance of listening. We up here in Reformed country, and you may not know this, maybe you've been in Zealand all your life and you go to Florida on spring break, and that's when you see other churches like the Baptists are down there and some different things. But up here in Zealand, I mean, there is, if you put a thumbtack and drew a five-mile circle around Zealand, there's probably 50 to 60 Reformed or Christian Reformed churches in that circle. There's probably more than that. When I first came up here, I was like, what is the Reformation going on up here? Like, I couldn't believe how many Reformed churches there was. And when we come to the Reformed understanding, we are people who love our doctrine. We know what we believe. We're a lot of us Calvinists. We have these Lutheran roots. We love the Reformation and the headiness of it. But the question I think is important to ask is, do we listen? Do we listen, right? When, have you ever, do you remember when you were a kid and you'd have a teacher who'd be talking to you and be like, hey, hey, listen to me. Anybody else? Or was that a gift only reserved for me, right? Because that was all the time. And I'm a little bit distractible. I'm a lot bit distractible. But, um, but the reality is that um, listening is a huge part of this. And I was having lunch with a friend who is just working with me in some leadership things. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, we were talking. He was talking to me about listening. I don't know, I wasn't paying that much attention, but I'm just joking. Um, but he was talking to me about listening, and, and I was sitting there, and as he was talking, it just dawned on me how bad I am at it, how bad I can be. I think I can be really good at times, but... Um, you know, working with Erica, we she knows when I start to disconnect from a meeting, when I quit listening, right? It's awesome. I don't even shade it. I slide back from the table, I grab my phone, and I'm just like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Do you think we ought to do that? Sure. And Erica will be like, put your phone away, away. And she tries to be subtle in my not-so-subtle way. Right? I, I can be someone who doesn't listen well at times when I disengage, but the reality we have to, to grab onto is people who don't listen well are people Jesus talked about often, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were in earshot of the Lord Jesus Christ. They could hear his words carried on the wind. And they didn't listen. They didn't listen well. And when we're up here in Reformed country and we know what we believe and we know what's right and we're going to stand up and we're going to declare it and we're going to defend the faith, it makes me think of uh, of a quote from a book, uh, another person who um, that I really like, Larry Osborne, he wrote Sticky Church, but he also wrote a book called Accidental Pharisee. And this quote is in there. Unfortunately, for most of us, when we think of having overzealous kind of pharisaical faith and being a jerk for Jesus, we picture someone with bad breath, bad theology, and no people skills, so it never dawns on us that it could be us. Isn't that true? We don't listen and we don't perceive how we're coming off. Jesus speaks to that today in this text. He warns us against really not listening and the hypocritical nature of knowing it all when you're not God. Join me as we read scripture. It says this in Luke chapter 12, verse one. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak, first to his disciples, saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. A little bit of hypocrisy gets into the whole loaf, right? It inflates the whole loaf. Loaf, there is nothing concealed, that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. Can you imagine 
if you told somebody a secret and they like shouted it from the rooftops or just put it on Twitter or Instagram, like quote from Eric Folkers today, right? And you're like, oh, well, you can't do that, right? But Jesus says, what you've said in the dark will be heard in the light and what you've whispered into the ear in an inner room in a secret place will be declared from the rooftops. I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you who you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth far more than sparrows than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, against Jesus, will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogues, the rulers and authorities, do not worry about what you will say and how you will defend yourselves. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that moment what you should say. This is a scripture that feels like a powder keg to me. Like there's a lot of things in here that make me uneasy and make me tremor a little bit when I think about them. But what I would like to do, since it's musical week, right, for Zealand High players, um, here in Zealand, like we're, we're musical folk. We're, we're like theater people up here. I know we've got a ton of swimmers and other sports and stuff, uh, you know, all kinds of things going. But right now it's like theater season. I know for like my daughter, she was in the Creekside Productions for the last number of years. Um, uh, there's been other kids on staff who were in those in, in Mary Poppins a couple weeks ago uh, at uh, Creekside. Then there's like, is it on the rooftops? Something like that. There's a play going in. I'm going to go see it. But, um, but there's a play going right now at Zealand High School. And we like, we love theater. We really get into it. It's a big production and we do it well. So today we're actually going to hold the idea, the understanding of looking at this through the lens of a theater through the lens of a theater. And we're going to take a look and kind of walk through it as if it were a production. So the the reality for us is like this imagery of a theater. I want you to think with me, like think of of DeWitt Auditorium over there at, at the high school. You have all this great seating to get a look at the stage. You have lighting on the stage that really illuminates everything. And then you have this, um, this specifically engineered venue to give good vision to every point of the stage. You have this set up so that everything that's going on on stage can be fully seen, fully understood. You have great sound and acoustics in there. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at maybe a little bit of what was going on in Jesus' day when he talked about hypocrisy. When Jesus talked about hypocrisy, what what he was talking about, the literal thing, is masks. And in the ancient world, there would have been actors who wore the masks, and they were the big deal. They were the, the main stage actors. Hypocrisy in the Greek means wearing a mask, having a false self. So when we look at this, we understand that Jesus is speaking to people who wear a mask, people who are not truly, well, themselves. They put on a good front, and Jesus doesn't just say there's people who wear masks. He says the Pharisees, the religious elite, the ones who look so good, it's nothing more than being made up. It's a mask. It's not who they are, but it's how they appear. And Jesus talks about this and really points us back towards the main players, the ones in the mask, the the lead in the show. And he calls them out for not being who they actually are. So let's take a look real quick, and let's look at verse 2 in this. Let's read through it. It says this. 
There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark and heard will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner room will be shouted from the rooftops. This is a great time to talk about the lighting in a theater. The lighting in a theater. Last week when I had you make faces, did you notice I had to do this to be able to see? Because when you're on a stage in any kind of like theater setup, there is light coming at you to do what? To light you up. But you can't often see what's going on. The seats can see really well, but the person on stage actually can see very little. They can see very little. But that stage being lit up puts everything into focus. If you've ever been to a really good um, musical or play, like I remember we went and saw um, A Christmas Carol over at the Goodman in Chicago. It was so good. And you could watch little things going on on side stage, like right off to the side. They weren't in the center of it, but they were still a part of the story because what they were doing over there it, it fed the narrative of what was going on on center stage. Everything on the stage was fully illuminated. Everything that was going on on stage is in full view. And Jesus is saying, it'll be so for us. It will be so for us as Christians. Everything will be in full view. When Erica and I, when we worked at uh, Vriesland Reformed, I was a youth pastor there for a number of years, and our daughter Isabella was in a uh, Christmas production there. Such a cute little outfit. I remember a little twill skirt and a little silver sweater. She was cute as could be, still is, but darling. And um, she was up there, and like, you know, you give the pep talk, remember your lines, sing the songs, pay attention. You, anybody, other, other parents who are like, don't misbehave, right? So Bella's up there, and she is next to somebody. And did she have the feather boa that year? I don't know. Somebody had a feather boa, because why not? It's Christmas. And um, so they had a feather boa, and feathers floating through just became too much. And she was like, <sighs> and she was puffing on them, and they were floating up. And then this little guy named Sawyer started battling for the feathers in front of everybody. And it became a war for feathers. Now, it wasn't like they were punching each other, but they'd be like, you know, kind of push somebody in the face, grab at the feather, but you can't grab the feather. It floats off somewhere else. So they're like, and and his parents were sitting there were like, please stop. We beg you to please stop. This is horrifying. We want this to end because they don't realize everybody's, they're focused on the little feather, but everybody's focused on them. And it's a great image of what Jesus is talking about. What goes on in the dark will be lit up like it's on the stage of a theater, and everybody out there will be able to see clearly, even if you don't think they can. So when we look at this, we understand the seriousness of what God's saying. Think of your life being put on the stage. And I don't know about you, but that, that terrifies me to think, not of being on a stage. It kind of happens to me every week. But, um, but the idea of being put on a stage and everything laid bare. But Jesus, in calling us to that kind of life, we have to remember he has the fix in. He knows that everything that is disreputable and broken in our lives will be made new in him if we will confess, repent, and turn from it. Our life will become this beautiful reflection of him. But if we hide things, even in the little secret places, they will be exposed. Well, just like we talked about, what is in the dark will come to light. So let's look now at the audience, because the audience plays a key role in every theatrical production. In every production, we know that the audience is this critical part. I don't know if you've ever been to a comedy show or something where people don't laugh. Oh, oh, it's brutal, because the comedian's trying so hard, and they're just like plywood staring back. There's just no emotion, nothing coming back. And they're like, come on, help me out. And they start to sound like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Hey, everybody. Because they're nervous and they don't know what to do. When the audience plays its part, we have to understand that there's engagement. But we also know this, that we who are on stage, and that's the Christian, we whose life is a living reflection of Christ, we have to know that we can't wear masks for the applause of the audience. The audience, we can't do things for the audience to cheer for us. We can't look a certain way for the applause of people and live a certain way 
behind the scenes because it will come to light. It will be on the main stage, and we have to understand. In verse 4, it says it this way. I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that do no more, which sounds pretty horrible to me, people who can kill the body but can do no more. Jesus goes a step deeper and says, let me tell you who you should be afraid of. I think this is an interesting moment because Jesus has taught us to call God Abba, Daddy, this very intimate language, right? And all of a sudden we see Jesus saying, but let me tell you who you should fear, who you should understand. Fear him who not only can kill the body after your body has been killed, but has the authority to then throw you into hell. Jesus is giving us a stark reality that hell is real and people apart from God go there. And Jesus is calling us to not be apart from God in any way and not be fickle and chasing the applause of the audience. Don't be bound to the applause of fickle people. Their opinion will change. People will change what they think of you regardless of what a good person you are. Regardless of how good your religious or professional performance is, they will turn. People always turn. They're fickle. Don't do everything for the applause of the crowd. Don't do it for them. And here's the reality. We can, we can hold on and we can trust that if we, as, as people who know the director, if we, as people who know the director, we can fear him and not everyone around us. There's this understanding in Christian faith called the fear of man. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but doing things to please people. It's the fear of man, and it's the fear that forces us to put on a mask that is ill-fitting, religious, and uh, makes us look apart so that people don't judge us. But what if God just calls you to be faithful in something that doesn't have a mask? Well, I would say this. He does that every time. He calls us away from the applause of the audience and into, into the earshot of the director, of the one who sees the story big. And I think this is the critical aspect because Jesus warns us, don't, do th- don't be afraid of people who can only kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can cast you into hell. Be afraid of the one who can separate you from God. That is the one we should be afraid of. That is the one whom we listen to, and I think it's a great role for the director in our analogy here. The director. Jesus speaks of the director in verse 5. It says this, I will show you who you should fear. Him who after your body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear him. But then Jesus goes on to say, are not five sparrows sold for a penny? And you're worth more than many sparrows. It reminds me of my favorite. I mean, if you don't know this, I am a C.S. Lewis junkie. Like when we went, oh, when I sat at the the Eagle and Child pub in Oxford where he and J.R.R. Tolkien um, would write together. And there's this little room called the Rabbit Room. And I was all misty-eyed and like ruined because I'm a, I'm just, I'm a nerd for pasty English theologians. I love them. And um, it, just being in there, I love C.S. Lewis. And he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. And I've used this quote before. I'll use it the rest of my life because he's talking about the great lion Aslan. And when we think of the great lion, you think of the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus. And so it's this, this kind of story that's using Aslan as the Christ figure. And this beaver, who's a talking beaver, makes every story better, um, he says, he's standing there and the children are with him. And, and one of the children says to the beaver, is, is this, they're going to meet the lion. And he said, is, is the lion, is, is he safe? And the beaver kind of giggles. I don't know how beavers giggle, but I I imagine that has that little whistle, you know, like on all the Disney kinds, you know, like that. But uh, anyways, um, so the beaver kind of laughs at him. He says, oh, child, no, he is not safe, but he is good. But he is good. And that's what I think this text is saying. Be, Be afraid of the one who can throw you into hell, who has the authority to to do that. Yes, I tell you, fear him. But also, don't forget, he's good because five sparrows are sold for a penny. Five sparrows are sold for a penny, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows, Jesus says. So don't forget to fear God, but also know he is good. He is good. He's not to be trifled with, but he is good. When we talk about the director, 
We have to understand that um, we come near to him because he loves us. He has proven time and again that he loves us. And in being loved by God, we are called close to him. So the reality for us is that we are called to fear him, but also draw near. And in drawing near, we find out that he is speaking quite tenderly, but there is a a baritone to his voice. There's an authority and a hold to his voice that makes us maybe quiver a little. When God speaks, when he convicts us, when he calls us, and when we get close and when we incline our ear and when we listen, we find ourselves in this moment where we have to choose. Will we follow the audience and go with the fickle applause of a crowd or will we really fear God and do what seems, well, maybe disgusting to the audience and they won't like it? Maybe it will offend and push them off. We have to remember this. And it's verses eight through 12 that we understand that we as people don't have the script. We don't know the end from the beginning, but the director does. We don't know the end of the story from the beginning, but the director does. So stop trying to do it on your own. Stop trying to do it on your own. We live in this life where it feels like we should have the answers, but it's okay that we don't. Actually, when we have the answers, we become the pharisaical people who always know the best Christian answer to any real world problem. And we, never cons- we often don't consult God because, well, we know. Maybe we don't know. Maybe we should go back to the one who has the script and let the director start giving lines. Jesus says it this way. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought in front of the audiences, the synagogues, the rulers and authorities who have authority to put you to death, that would be an implied fact, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that moment what you should say. What that tells me is this. He knows the story from beginning to end. And you may say, Eric, I may freeze up. I may freeze up on stage. But if you've been in the word of God, praying in in relationship and know the voice of God, here's what's wonderful. You actually know the message. You know the message that this scene of your life is supposed to portray. So maybe you're on the stage of your life and you're standing there and you have that horrible moment that I think every actor has to have where they're like, fine, right? They forget what's going on. And the reality is when we have those moments where we don't know what to do, we know this, that the director will guard and guide us because they have trained us in such a way so that we can stay in the message of the scene even if we don't feel like we have our lines down perfectly or we freeze up a little. Maybe you've had moments where you wanted to share your faith and you kind of stumbled in it and you're like, oh, maybe you were supposed to be loving or gracious and you really were just cold and hard and you feel like you failed, but that doesn't mean the full message of your life is a failure. It means that you know now how you don't want to lock up again. You want to follow the director's lead because not only does he have authority to remove you from stage, he actually has authority to use anyone he wants. Anyone he wants. How amazing that he chose you and I. I think that's so crazy that he chose us. But lest we should boast in our state, I want to read you a story from Numbers chapter 22. There is the story of Balaam and his donkey. It says this, they were walking to send, there was, a, there was an oracle and he was going to, to curse the children of Israel and God was not for this. So this guy, this prophet, um, who he was an oracle, he wouldn't have been a prophet, he was going to curse the people of Israel and he's riding his donkey and the Lord put an angel of the Lord in front of it and it says this, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it scraped against the wall and scraped Balaam's foot against the wall. So he became mad and he beat it with a cane. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where it kind of bottlenecks. Um, And there was no way to turn either to the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it just laid down under Balaam. Balaam's anger was kindled and he beat the donkey with his staff. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and he said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? Like, I love that story. Can you imagine? 
like after your dog ate a shoe and threw it up on the carpet, and you're like, stupid dog. You know, maybe you wouldn't kick your dog. I wouldn't kick my dog. But, um, but like if it looked, it's like, why have you kicked me these three times for eating glue and throwing up in the living room? What? This, this donkey begins speaking. And Balaam speaks back. Because you have made a fool of me. I love that line. When you're talking to a donkey, you're not looking genius. I wish I had a, but he goes on like, this is the best. You have made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand. I would kill you right now. And the donkey replies, am I not your donkey, which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I been in the habit of treating you this way? And he said, no. Here's the message of this. The director will put who he wants on stage. The director will use whatever in the created order to declare his glories. But the reality for us is this, that he called us. He chose us not only to do something on stage, but the reality is he chose us to know you and then let you and I tell the story that he has written. He chose you and I to tell the story that he has written, the story that was written in the very blood of Christ, the story that was was architected and created from the beginning of time. When we look at our life and we understand that maybe we should speak less, listen more, and just obey the Spirit of God, we find ourselves participating in the story that God has written to teach not only the world, but to guide the world into a place of repentance. We don't necessarily do it by our words. Again, Francis of Assisi, the great Catholic saint, said this, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Let the stage of your life be a way to reflect what God's doing in you and through you. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to hold fast to the word of God and to see our lives, God, in somewhat of a stage that we are living a life that is well visible to the world around us. And we ask that this life that is being lived would not be for our glory or for the applause of the crowds around us, but it would be for the glory of Jesus Christ. So we ask you to call us to a small obedience. Lord, it's terrifying to think when we have to obey in these big things. So we just ask that you would call us to a small obedience and ever increase that call till we obey in the big and the little things, till our lives are a living testament of your goodness and your redemptive power. Lord Jesus Christ, help us to be a people who listen but also trust that you, the director, the author and perfecter of our faith, You will send your spirit to help us give witness to you. You will send your spirit to transform us, to help us be good enough because we can't do it on our own. So today, God, we relax back into the arms of grace and we just ask courage to us who are called only to listen and obey. Would you give courage to us that we would live in that rhythm of of close listening and then immediate obedience to the joy and the will of the Spirit of God and the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.